All right, y'all. We grow in the day. Jesus, bless the eyes and ears of the listeners. I plead your blood on this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, y'all. So we've been going over God's commands, um, all that stuff. Google Meters, your lesson's already on my channel. Go look for it. It's in the title. Okay, so now we're going to talk about cultivating this love, the fruit of the Spirit. Cultivating the fruit of the Spirit. You'll find the fruit of the Spirit, you guys, in Galatians 5. Twenty-two through twenty-three. Oops. Yeah, three. Fruit of the spirit. And this is what should be transforming your spirit. Okay, so you need to understand this in the name of Jesus. Okay, so the word of God should transform your life. If you're not hearing God figure out what you're not doing, okay? Probably abiding in Jesus Christ is what you're probably not doing. Abiding in means obey him and letting him change you. He'll work with you first, okay? Then the answers will come. So no topic has been explored by songwriters more than love, right? If you've seen my worship section on my playlist, you know that God has given me songs to write, okay? And what are they about love? And while songs, something like the Beatles, um, Through the Years by Kenny Rogers, uh, I Will Always Love You, Whitney Houston, you know, generated a lot of album sales, right? None of these pop culture songs have been able to fully provide a faithful description of true love. Amen? Huh? Well, what does the Bible say about love? To our love-starved world, what does it say? Write it down. It says love originates in God. All right, God's, I'm going to quit Bible script. I'm just throwing the scripture out to you now. God's essential nature is love. 1 John 4, verses 8 and 16. This means that everything he does stems from love and is entirely consistent with his love. And since God is infinite, his love is endless. Amen? Hmm? Okay, put down, love is essentially selfless. Write down. The attributes of love praised by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, have, have, have an other focus. Okay? True love isn't proud. It's not boastful. It is protective and patient, and kind. Put that down. It is protective. Right in little parentheses. Protective. Patient. Kind. Just like God has over this ministry. He's very protective over my ministry, y'all. He's very protective because of what I'm going through. I'm telling you, he has a protection around my ministry and the people I teach because it's him. Okay. Love, it seeks the good of other people. You don't want to talk bash bad about people. You see something good in everybody or something there. In other words, real love is selfless. All right. Think about this. When God, the one who is love, decided to reveal himself to the world in John 1, 18. He did so by sending who? Jesus, a selfless servant. And when I stood before him 17 years ago, that's what I stood before, a selfless servant. His robe wasn't uh, shining in, in a big ball of light. We were in the desert because of my, my situation. My life was in the desert. Okay, he was there in a white robe, but it was it was like a selfless servant. He comes to you, it depends on your situation. Okay, my situation was pretty bad. So if we watch Jesus closely, you get a front row seat to how love is supposed to work. All right, in the Gospels, we see Jesus serving others constantly. In the end, we see him giving himself as a sacrifice. 
So Jesus not only said, greater love has no man than this to lay down one's life for his friends in John 15, 13. He modeled it. He did it. All right, write down love begets love. John said, we love because he first loved us, 1 John 4, 19. So when God's love breaks through to us, that is, when we understand what we are right now, loved unconditionally, totally, perfectly, passionately, and eternally, then we no longer have to move through the world frantically trying to get love. Understand that in the name of Jesus. Instead, we are free to give love to others. There you go. Right? We realize we're safe in God's endless love. You are safe in God's love. And so we become conduits of it. Amen? All right, put down love requires action. Underline that, y'all. Love requires action. From who? From you. Compassionate feelings, they're fine, okay? They're okay to have. They're just not enough. It's not enough. Mushy words, you know, they got their place. But true love transcends talk. All right, 1 John 3.18 says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. People, you know what? What how did my mama say it? Actions are louder than your words. Actions speak louder than words. Words are nothing. They're, they're nice to hear sometimes, but that don't mean they got meaning to them. But your actions do. When you love Jesus Christ, you all, when you truly love him, there will be evidence. I'll see it. I'll see it. I will see it. He will see it. Others will see it. Okay? And notice that John 3, 16 doesn't read, For God so loved the world, he felt downright awful about the world's flight. No, God did what? He acted. He acted. His love prompted him to give his son, Jesus Christ, okay? So I want you to ask God to help you better understand his miraculous, life-changing love. Okay, even though, as Paul said, it's beyond our knowing in Ephesians 3.19, then think of two concrete ways that you could selflessly demonstrate God's love to two people that he's placed in your life. Think about that. And go to Galatians 5.22-23. Read through the fruits of the Spirit, which are love, goodness, joy, peace, forbearance, self-control, gentleness, faithfulness, and kindness. And work on... Uh, demonstrating those fruits of the spirit okay all right i'm going to wrap that up today um you can go to my website jesusdoers.com and we can go uh, you can learn there about the armor of god work on your fruit tree y'all you're a branch remember that if you're in jesus christ you're a branch and and these little uh fruits of the spirit is supposed to be all over your tree understand that in the name of jesus if your tree don't have no fruits on it, y'all, uh, Jesus is going to break them branches off and burn them up because they're not worth nothing spiritually. Understand that, okay? I'm here to try to help you, you guys. I spend all my time in my life now trying to help you understand that and fall in love with him, okay? Go uh, look for the, on my website, the armor of God. You'll find the armor in Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. I'll do one more video to catch y'all up because I know some of y'all will look, some, some will listen, some will not. The armor of God. You got the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. Fit it, you know, I'm going to go through that. The shield of faith, all that. The helmet of salvation. We're going to go through that. Okay? So just let me upload this. No, no, no. Forget it. I got 10. I'm only 10 minutes into this. I'll do it right now. Turn your Bible. Let me erase this now. Turn your Bible to Ephesians. You got to back the video up. And I told you, here we are Jesus doers, y'all. We don't play around. We're in the last days. Understand this. You're in, uh, you, see, you know what? A military prepares their troops for battle before they send them out to uh, the Middle East or wherever they go. They prepare their troops for battle. And they don't mess around. And God is preparing us here.
for battle. He's not messing around. So turn to Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. The armor of God. Why? Because you're a soldier. That's why. You are a soldier. And you better get armored up in the name of Jesus. I told you, there's no time. It shouldn't take y'all a year to grow into any kind of maturity levels here in Jesus Christ. We grow. We don't mess around. All right, Ephesians consists of three eye-popping chapters of our riches in Christ, followed by three practical chapters of our responsibilities to Christ. Okay, so we have... We have... Uh, hold on a minute. Yeah, we have, let me find my marker that works right. We have a responsibility you have a responsibility to Christ. That's right. You do. In Jesus name, understand that you have a you have a I should write that on there. My markers are getting all mixed up. You have a, or you could put, I have a responsibility to Christ. I like that word in Jesus' name. Because we do. All right, near the end of the letter, Paul mentions the somber reality of spiritual warfare. Now, we've seen people come new here that need spiritual warfare prayer. But I'm going to tell you something. There's no sense in you doing spiritual warfare prayer until you abide in Jesus first. I'm talking about you can't do go into battle when you're not ready. It's going to do you no good. In other words, if you go into spiritual warfare battle and you yourself are not abiding in Christ, it's not going to do you any good. Understand? But the ones that will do good is when you accept Jesus as your Savior and you're like, you're diving in the ocean head first. You're like, God, I'm going to do whatever it is you want me to do. I'm going to know you. I'm going to get in your word and I'm going to live according to it. Then you can do some spiritual warfare battle and it will matter. Understand that. All right, Paul mentions the somber reality of spiritual warfare. So speaking of the devil's schemes and our struggles against the spiritual forces of evil, he urges, put on the full armor of God, which is in uh, Ephesians 6, 11 through 12. He's telling you, put it on, put on the armor. All right, I think Paul wrote this when he was under house arrest in Rome. When he wrote these words, guarded constantly by an armed Roman soldier. Okay, so he was in prison a lot, boy. He caught it. He caught it, didn't he? All right, so surely this experience inspired Paul's military imaginary, you know, imagery for how to uh, stand firm in 614 in the faith. Meaning he was under persecution and he still stood firm in his faith. He sure did. Have the belt of truth buckled around your waist, Paul urges in 614. A soldier's leather belt provided a place to hang their sword and a means for uh, cinching up uh, his loose tunic in order to be unhindered while fighting or marching or something. So Paul's point seems to be that when we allow God's truth to both surround and shape our lives, because it should surround and shape your life, Transform it. We develop integrity, which in return brings what? Integrity? Integrity. Write it down. Integrity brings security. Copy the stuff, man. You'll find that in... Uh, Proverbs 10, 9. We was in Proverbs yesterday. You're letting God transform your life from the old you to the new you that you are now in Christ Jesus. All right. It says, make sure the breastplate of righteousness is in its place. Paul says in 614, these uh, ancient 
flask jackets type of thing were made of leather and covered in metal plates or, or chain mail. And they provided protection for a warrior's vital organs. You know, the neck to waist and front to back. So the implication here is that by putting on and living out, understand that, the righteousness, you are to live righteously, is what this means. It's telling you to live righteous. Live righteous. Live, what is righteous? Christ-like. So, if you say you've given your life to Jesus Christ, and you're, you know you're not living Christ-like, then you do not have the breastplate of righteousness on. Some of your armor is not on you. You need to get it on you. Okay? You are to live out the righteousness that is given to us in Christ Jesus. Romans 5, 19. We are sh when you live righteously, y'all, you're shielded from sin's evil consequences. Understand that. Okay? N noting the hobnailed sandals, right, laced around the ankles and shins of his guard, Paul adds that a believer's feet should be fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Okay, in 6.15, it's by standing strong in the gospel that we find firm footing in a war-torn world. You stand right for what's God's. You, stay, you go right by, you do right by God, even when it's getting really bad. The gospel gives us, and those who we share it with, peaceful, stable lives. All right, Paul speaks about the shield of faith in 6.16. This large, either round or rectangular piece of wood was covered in animal skin and bound with iron. And when it was wet, it helped extinguish all the uh, flaming arrows that were coming at them in 616, uh, fired by the enemy. You know, you shoot fiery arrows. So Paul is suggesting that by trusting in God's character and promises, by trusting in God's character and in his promises, we are shielded from the assaults of the enemy. So what does that mean? That means you trust God. No matter what you see going on around you, you trust God. Then you put on the helmet of salvation, 617. Brings to mind the Roman helmets made of iron or bronze that lined with cloth or sponge, right? These were sometimes decorated with distinctive uh, plumes of, or markings, like with the little horses, look like horse hair on the top of it to separate uh, who was with who, you know. The idea is that by knowing and understanding our true identity and destiny, Christians can avoid becoming casualties. I'm going to say it again. The idea of putting on the helmet of salvation. Let me show this to you. They wore helmets. I can't draw no helmet, y'all. I'm going to try to. All right, here's the helmet. Here's a Roman soldier. And they had little different things that on top of it coming out of their head different colors to tell who they belong to what what uh what sect they belong to might be green might be blue well let the world know who you belong to live righteously tell god let god see who you belong to okay stand out with the helmet of salvation Okay, the idea again is that by knowing and understanding our true identity and destiny, we can avoid becoming casualties. Finally, Paul mentions an offensive weapon. Now, all those I just mentioned are for your protection. That will protect you, but you got a weapon that you can stand up and fight with, which is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the Bible. By rightly handling scripture, we're able like Jesus in Matthew 4, to parry the enemy's blows and strike back at his demonic lies with eternal truth. What does that mean? That means you are studying God's word. You are finding out, oh, he wants me to forgive people. Okay, he wants me to, to stop, never stop praying, study it. He wants me to help the church with my money part. He wants me, everything that it says to do, do it. I'm just going through bits and pieces. I don't care what y'all think about it. It's in God's word. All of it. I'm talking about all of it. Everything he tells you to do. I've done went through a bunch of it on the sec two videos, the three videos I did today. 
Live righteously. That means in everything you do, be Christ-like. Understand God's word. Live according and obeying God's word, the Bible. That's your weapon. Because if you're living according to God's word, you're obeying it, Satan can't. It, it, kill, it hurts him, y'all. It hurts him because he can't do nothing with you. He can't touch you. It's your sword. All right, we're going to drop it right there in the name of Jesus. Um, I might come up later on. I've done put up. We done went through wisdom, Proverbs. I mean, we've covered a lot in the past two days. So foolish talk, foolish behavior, you know, um, getting serious with God, all that. It don't take a year to catch up. God's growing you up quickly here at We Are Jesus Doers. He's coming. There's the lesson, Google Meters. It's already on the uh, my channel. Go look for it. It's made today. It's got Google Meets in the title. Have that to class tomorrow night at Google Meets. All right. You can find the Google Meet information on the website, which is jesusdoers.com. If you want to prepare and stock up with food and water, go see my Patriot link there on jesusdoers.com. If you want to find out about the jab, or some world news, go to my website, JesusDoers.com. Those of you that um, honor God's word and help this ministry back that's teaching you, and you're a part of, and you're helping us back financially with God's portion or with your love offering, go check and see what you're a part of doing, because you are, on JesusDoers.com, what we're doing in Africa. And thank you for helping us back, okay? Thank you all for loving God and trusting him and supporting the kingdom of God. Thank you all so much. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm done for now.